Hello friends, I'm Ellie, welcome to Cardboard Design. Today, I will tell you meaningful fairy tales. Let's listen together. The first fairy tale, the glass coffin. Let no one ever say that a poor tailor cannot do great things and win high honors. All that is needed is that he should go to the right smithy. And what is of most consequence, that he should have good luck. A civil, a dry tailor's apprentice once went out traveling and came into a great forest. And as he did not know the way, he lost himself. Night fell and nothing was left for him to do but to seek a bed in this painful solitude. He might certainly have found a good bed on the soft moss, but the fear of wild beasts let him have no rest there, and at last he was forced to make up his mind to spend the night in a tree. He sought out a high oak, climbed up to the top of it, and thanked God that he had his goose with him, for otherwise the wind which blew over the top of the tree would have carried him away. After he had spent some hours in the darkness, not without fear and trembling, he saw at a very short distance the glimmer of a light, and as he thought that a human habitation might be there, where he would be better off than on the branches of a tree. He got carefully down and went towards the light. It guided him to a small hut that was woven together of reeds and rushes. He knocked boldly, the door opened, and by the light which came forth he saw a little hoary old man who wore a coat made of bits of colored stuff sewn together. Who are you? And what do you want? Asked the man in a grumbling voice. I am a poor tailor. He answered. Whom night has surprised here in the wilderness, and I earnestly beg you to take me into your hut until morning. Go your way! Replied the old man in a surly voice. I will have nothing to do with renegades. Seek for yourself a shelter elsewhere. After these words he was about to slip into his hut again. But the tailor held him so tightly by the corner of his coat, and pleaded so piteously, that the old man, who was not so ill-natured as he wished to appear, was at last softened, and took him into the hut with him where he gave him something to eat, and then pointed out to him a very good bed in a corner. The weary tailor needed no rocking, but slept sweetly till morning, but even then would not have thought of getting up, if he had not been aroused by a great noise. A violent sound of screaming and roaring forced its way through the thin walls of the hut. The tailor, full of unwanted courage, jumped up, put his clothes on in haste, and hurried out. Then close by the hut, he saw a great black bull and a beautiful stag, which were just preparing for a violent struggle. They rushed at each other with such extreme rage that the ground shook with their trampling, and the air resounded with their cries. For a long time it was uncertain which of the two would gain the victory. At length the stag thrust his horns into his adversary's body, whereupon the bull fell to the earth with a terrific roar and was thoroughly dispatched by a few strokes from the stag. The tailor, who had watched the fight with astonishment, was still standing there motionless when the stag in full career bounded up to him and before he could escape caught him up on his great horn. He had not much time to collect his thoughts for it went in a swift race over stock and stone, mountain and valley, wood and meadow. He held with both hands to the tops of the horns and resigned himself to his fate. It seemed, however, to him just as if he were flying away. At length the stag stopped in front of a wall of rock and gently let the tailor down. The tailor, more dead than alive, required a longer time than that to come to himself. When he had in some degree recovered, the stag, which had remained standing by him, pushed its horns with such force against a door which was in the rock that it sprang open. Flames of fire shot forth, after which followed a great smoke, which hid the stag from his sight. The tailor did not know what to do, or whither to turn, in order to get out of this desert and back to human beings again. Whilst he was standing thus undecided, a voice sounded out of the rock, which cried to him, Enter without fear, no evil shall befall you there. He hesitated, but driven by a mysterious force, he obeyed the voice and went through the iron door into a large spacious hall whose ceiling, walls and floor were made of shining polished square stones, on each of which were cut letters which were unknown to him. He looked at everything full of admiration, and was on the point of going out again, when he once more heard the voice which said to him, Step on the stone which lies in the middle of the hall, and great good fortune awaits there. His courage had already grown so great that he obeyed the order. The stone began to give way under his feet, and sank slowly down into the depths. When it was once more firm, and the tailor looked round, he found himself in a hall which in size resembled the former. 
Here, however, there was more to look at and to admire. Hollow places were cut in the walls, in which stood vases of transparent glass which were filled with colored spirit or with a bluish vapor. On the floor of the hall two great glass chests stood opposite to each other, which at once excited his curiosity. When he went to one of them he saw inside it a handsome structure like a castle surrounded by farm buildings, stables and barns, and a quantity of other good things. Everything was small, but exceedingly carefully and delicately made, and seemed to be cut out by a dexterous hand with the greatest exactitude. He might not have turned away his eyes from the consideration of this rarity for some time, if the voice had not once more made itself heard. It ordered him to turn round and look at the glass chest which was standing opposite. How his admiration increased when he saw therein a maiden of the greatest beauty. She lay as if asleep, and was wrapped in her long fair hair as in a precious mantle. Her eyes were closely shut, but the brightness of her complexion and a ribbon which her breathing moved to and fro, left no doubt that she was alive. The tailor was looking at the beauty with beating heart, when she suddenly opened her eyes, and started up at the sight of him in joyful terror. Just heaven? cried she. My deliverance is at hand. Quick, quick, help me out of my prison. If thou pushest back the bolt of this glass coffin, then I shall be free. The tailor obeyed without delay, and she immediately raised up the glass lid, came out and hastened into the corner of the hall, where she covered herself with a large cloak. Then she seated herself on a stone, ordered the young man to come to her, and after she had imprinted a friendly kiss on his lips, she said, My long-desired deliverer, kind heaven has guided thee to me, and put an end to my sorrows. Thou art the husband chosen for me by heaven and shall pass thy life in unbroken joy, loved by me, and rich to overflowing in every earthly possession. Seat thyself, and listen to the story of my life. I am the daughter of a rich count. My parents died when I was still in my tender youth, and recommended me in their last will to my elder brother, by whom I was brought up. We loved each other so tenderly, and were so alike in our way of thinking and our inclinations, that we both embraced the resolution never to marry, but to stay together to the end of our lives. In our house there was no lack of company, neighbors and friends visited us often, and we showed the greatest hospitality to everyone. So it came to pass one evening that a stranger came riding to our castle, and, under pretext of not being able to get on to the next place, begged for shelter for the night. We granted his request with ready courtesy, and he entertained us in the most agreeable manner during supper by conversation intermingled with stories. My brother liked the stranger so much that he begged him to spend a couple of days with us, to which, after some hesitation, he consented. We did not rise from table until late in the night, the stranger was shown to room, and I hastened, as I was tired, to lay my limbs in my soft bed. Hardly had I slept for a short time, when the sound of faint and delightful music awoke me. As I could not conceive from whence it came, I wanted to summon my waiting maid who slept in the next room, but to my astonishment I found that speech was taken away from me by an unknown force. I felt as if a mountain were weighing down my breast, and was unable to make the very slightest sound. In the meantime, by the light of my night lamp, I saw the stranger enter my room through two doors which were fast bolted. He came to me and said, that by magic arts which were at his command, he had caused the lovely music to sound in order to awaken me, and that he now forced his way through all fastenings with the intention of offering me his hand and heart. My repugnance to his magic arts was, however, so great, that I vouchsafed him no answer. He remained for a time standing without moving, apparently with the idea of waiting for a favorable decision, but as I continued to keep silence, he angrily declared he would revenge himself and find means to punish my pride, and left the room.
I passed the night in the greatest disquietude and only fell asleep towards morning. When I awoke, I hurried to my brother but did not find him in his room and the attendants told me that he had ridden forth with a stranger to the chase by daybreak. I at once suspected nothing good. I dressed myself quickly, ordered my palfrey to be saddled, and accompanied only by one servant, rode full gallop to the forest. The servant fell with his horse and could not follow me, for the horse had broken its foot. I pursued my way without halting, and in a few minutes I saw the stranger coming towards me with a beautiful stag which he led by a cord. I asked him where he had left my brother, and how he had come by this stag, out of whose great eyes I saw tears flowing. Instead of answering me, he began to laugh loudly. I fell into great rage at this, pulled out a pistol and discharged it at the monster, but the ball rebounded from his breast and went into my horse's head. I fell to the ground, and the stranger muttered some words which deprived me of consciousness. When I came to my senses again, I found myself in this underground cave in a glass coffin. The magician appeared once again and said he had changed my brother into a stag, my castle with all that belonged to it diminished in size by his arts, he had shut up in the other glass chest, and my people, who were all turned into smoke, he had confined in glass bottles. He told me that if I would now comply with his wish, it was an easy thing for him to put everything back in its former state, as he had nothing to do but open the vessels, and everything would return once more to its natural form. I answered him as little as I had done the first time. He vanished and left me in my prison, in which a deep sleep came on me. Amongst the visions which passed before my eyes, that was the most comforting in which a young man came and set me free, and when I opened my eyes today, I saw thee, and beheld my dream fulfilled. Help me to accomplish the other things which happened in those visions. The first is that we lift the glass chest in which my castle is enclosed, onto that broad stone. As soon as the stone was laden, it began to rise up on high with the maiden and the young man, and mounted through the opening of the ceiling into the upper hall, from whence they then could easily reach the open air, here the maiden opened the lid, and it was marvelous to behold how the castle, the houses, and the farm buildings which were enclosed, stretched themselves out and grew to their natural size with the greatest rapidity. After this, the maiden and the tailor returned to the cave beneath the earth, and had the vessels which were filled with smoke carried up by the stone. The maiden had scarcely opened the bottles when the blue smoke rushed out and changed itself into living men, in whom she recognized her servants and her people. Her joy was still more increased when her brother, who had killed the magician in the form of the bull, came out of the forest towards them in his human form, and on the self same day the maiden, in accordance with her promise, gave her hand at the altar to the lucky tailor. Despite getting lost and encountering difficult challenges, the tailor does not give up. He overcomes fear to seek solutions to his predicament. The love between the tailor and the princess is built on understanding and mutual assistance during difficult times. Their ultimate reward is everlasting happiness and love. The narrative emphasizes the miraculous, showcasing how the strength of the human heart and love can conquer all difficulties, even magical ones. The Second Fairy Tale The Griffin There was once upon a time a king, but where he reigned and what he was called, I do not know. He had no son, but an only daughter who had always been ill, and no doctor had been able to cure her. Then it was foretold to the king that his daughter should eat herself well with an apple. So he ordered it to be proclaimed throughout the whole of his kingdom, that whosoever brought his daughter an apple with which she could eat herself well, should have her to wife and be king. This became known to a peasant who had three sons, and he said to the eldest, Go out into the garden and take a basket full of those beautiful apples with the red cheeks and carry them to the court. Perhaps the king's daughter will be able to eat herself well with them, and then thou wilt marry her and be king. The lad did so and set out. 
When he had gone a short way, he met a little iron man who asked him what he had there in the basket, to which replied Yul, for so was he named. Frog's legs! On this the little man said, Well, so shall it be, and remain. And went away. At length Yul arrived at the palace, and made it known that he had brought apples which would cure the king's daughter if she ate them. This delighted the king hugely, and he caused Yul to be brought before him, but, alas, when he opened the basket, instead of having apples in it he had frog's legs which were still kicking about. On this the king grew angry, and had him driven out of the house. When he got home he told his father how it had fared with him. Then the father sent the next son, who was called Seam, but all went with him just as it had gone with Yule. He also met the little iron man, who asked what he had there in the basket. Seam said, Hogs bristles! And the iron man said, Well, so shall it be, and remain. When Seam got to the king's palace and said he brought apples with which the king's daughter might eat herself well, they did not want to let him go in, and said that one fellow had already been there, and had treated them as if they were fools. Seam, however, maintained that he certainly had the apples, and that they ought to let him go in. At length they believed him, and led him to the king. But when he uncovered the basket, he had but hogs bristles. This enraged the king most terribly, so he caused Seam to be whipped out of the house. When he got home he related all that had befallen him. Then the youngest boy, whose name was Hunt, but who was always called Stupid Hunt, came and asked his father if he might go with some apples. Oh! Said the father, Thou wouldst be just the right fellow for such a thing. If the clever ones can't manage it, what canst thou do? The boy, however, did not believe him, and said, Indeed, father, I wish to go. Just get away, thou stupid fellow! Thou must wait till thou art wiser!" said the father to that, and turned his back. Hans, however, pulled at the back of his smock frock and said, Indeed, father, I wish to go. Well, then, so far as I am concerned thou mayst go, but thou wilt soon come home again, replied the old man in a spiteful voice. The boy, however, was tremendously delighted and jumped for joy. Well. Act like a fool! Thou growest more stupid every day!" said the father again. Hans, however, did not care about that, and did not let it spoil his pleasure, but as it was then night, he thought he might as well wait until the morrow, for he could not get to court that day. All night long he could not sleep in his bed, and if he did doze for a moment, he dreamt of beautiful maidens, of palaces, of gold, and of silver, and all kinds of things of that sort. Early in the morning, he went forth on his way, and directly afterwards the little shabby-looking man in his iron clothes came to him and asked what he was carrying in the basket. Hans gave him the answer that he was carrying apples with which the king's daughter was to eat herself well. Then, said the little man, So shall they be, and remain. But at the court they would none of them let Hans go in, for they said two had already been there who had told them that they were bringing apples, and one of them had frog's legs, and the other hog's bristles. Hans, however, resolutely maintained that he most certainly had no frog's legs, but some of the most beautiful apples in the whole kingdom. As he spoke so pleasantly, the doorkeeper thought he could not be telling a lie, and asked him to go in, and he was right. For when Hans uncovered his basket in the king's presence, golden yellow apples came tumbling out. The king was delighted, and caused some of them to be taken to his daughter, and then waited in anxious expectation until news should be brought to him of the effect they had. But before much time had passed by, news was brought to him, but who do you think it was who came? It was his daughter herself. As soon as she had eaten of those apples, she was cured, and sprang out of her bed. The joy the king felt cannot be described. But now he did not want to give his daughter in marriage to Hans, and said he must first make him a boat which would go quicker on dry land than on water. Hans agreed to the condition, and went home, and related how it had fared with him. Then the father sent Yul into the forest to make a boat of that kind. He worked diligently, and whistled all the time. At midday, when the sun was at the highest, came the little iron man and asked what he was making. Yul gave him for answer. Wooden bowls for the kitchen. The Iron Man said, So it shall be, and remain. 
By evening, Neil thought he had now made the boat, but when he wanted to get into it, he had nothing but wooden bowls. The next day, Seam went into the forest, but everything went with him just as it had done with Yul. On the third day, stupid Hans went. He worked away most industriously, so that the whole forest resounded with the heavy strokes, and all the while he sang and whistled right merrily. At midday, when it was the hottest, the little man came again and asked what he was making. A boat which will go quicker on dry land than on the water, replied Hans. And when I have finished it, I am to have the king's daughter for my wife. Uh, well, said the little man. Such an one shall it be, and remain. In the evening, when the sun had turned into gold, Hans finished his boat, and all that was wanted for it, he got into it and rode to the palace. The boat went as swiftly as the wind. The king saw it from afar but would not give his daughter to Hans yet, and said he must first take a hundred hares out to pasture from early morning until late evening, and if one of them got away, he should not have his daughter. Hans was contented with this, and the next day went with his flock to the pasture, and took great care that none of them ran away. Before many hours had passed came a servant from the palace, and told Hans that he must give her a hair instantly, for some visitors had come unexpectedly. Hans, however, was very well aware what that meant, and said he would not give her one, the king might set some hair soup before his guest next day. The maid, however, would not believe in his refusal, and at last she began to get angry with him. Then Hans said that if the king's daughter came herself, he would give her a hair. The maid told this in the palace, and the daughter did go herself. In the meantime, however, the little man came again to Hans, and asked him what he was doing there. He said he had to watch over a hundred hares and see that none of them ran away, and then he might marry the king's daughter and be king. Good! said the little man. There is a whistle for thee, and if one of them runs away, just whistle with it, and then it will come back again. When the king's daughter came, Hans gave her a hair into her apron, but when she had gone about a hundred steps with it, he whistled, and the hair jumped out of the apron, and before she could turn round was back to the flock again. When the evening came the hare herd whistled once more, and looked to see if all were there, and then drove them to the palace. The king wondered how Hans had been able to take a hundred hares to graze without losing any of them. He would, however, not give him his daughter yet, and said he must now bring him a feather from the griffin's tail. Hans set out at once, and walked straight forwards. In the evening he came to a castle, and there he asked for a night's lodging, for at that time there were no inns. The lord of the castle promised him that with much pleasure, and asked where he was going. Hans answered, To the griffin. Oh, to the griffin. They tell me he knows everything, and I have lost the key of an iron money chest, so you might be so good as to ask him where it is. Yes, indeed, said Hans. I will do that. Early the next morning he went onward, and on his way arrived at another castle in which he again stayed the night. When the people who lived there learned that he was going to the griffin, they said they had in the house a daughter who was ill, and that they had already tried every means to cure her but none of them had done her any good. And he might be so kind as to ask the griffin what would make their daughter healthy again. Hans said he would willingly do that, and went onward. Then he came to a lake, and instead of a ferry boat, a tall, tall man was there who had to carry everybody across. The man asked Hans whither he was journeying. To the griffin, said Hans. Then when you get to him, said the man, just ask him why I am forced to carry everybody over the lake. Yes, indeed, most certainly I'll do that, said Hans. Then the man took him up on his shoulders and carried him across. At length Hans arrived at the griffin's house, but the wife only was at home, and not the griffin himself. Then the woman asked him what he wanted. Thereupon he told her everything, that he had to get a feather out of the griffin's tail, and that there was a castle where they had lost the key of their money chest, and he was to ask the griffin where it was. That in another castle the daughter was ill, and he was to learn what would cure her. And then not far from thence there was a lake and a man beside it, who was forced to carry people across it, and he was very anxious to learn why the man was obliged to do it. Then said the woman, 
But look here, my good friends. No Christian can speak to the griffin. He devours them all. But if you like, you can lie down under his bed. And in the night, when he is quite fast asleep, you can reach out and pull a feather out of his tail. And as for those things which you are to learn, wow. I will ask about them myself. Hans was quite satisfied with this and got under the bed. In the evening, the griffin came home and as soon as he entered the room, said, Wife, I smell a Christian. Yes, said the woman. One was here today, but he went away again. And on that the griffin said no more. In the middle of the night when the griffin was snoring loudly, Hans reached out and plucked a feather from his tail. The griffin woke up instantly and said, Wife, I smell a Christian, and it seems to me that somebody was pulling at my tail. His wife said, Thou hast certainly been dreaming, and I told thee before that a Christian was here today, but that he went away again. He told me all kinds of things that in one castle they had lost the key of their money chest and could find it nowhere. Oh, the fools, said the griffin. The key lies in the wood, house under a log of wood behind the door. And then he said that in another castle the daughter was ill, and they knew no remedy that would cure her. Oh, the fools, said the griffin. Under the cellar steps a toad has made its nest of her hair, and if she got her hair back she would be well. And then he also said that there was a place where there was a lake and a man beside it who was forced to carry everybody across. Oh, the fool, said the griffin. If he only put one man down in the middle, he would never have to carry another across. Early the next morning, the griffin got up and went out. Then Hans came forth from under the bed, and he had a beautiful feather and had heard what the griffin had said about the key and the daughter and the fairy man. The griffin's wife repeated it all once more to him that he might not forget it, and then he went home again. First he came to the man by the lake, who asked him what the griffin had said, but Hans replied that he must first carry him across, and then he would tell him. So the man carried him across, and when he was over Hans told him that all he had to do was to set one person down in the middle of the lake, and then he would never have to carry over any more. The man was hugely delighted and told Hans that out of gratitude he would take him once more across and back again. But Hans said no, he would save him the trouble. He was quite satisfied already and pursued his way. Then he came to the castle where the daughter was ill. He took her on his shoulders, for she could not walk, and carried her down the cellar steps and pulled out the toad's nest from beneath the lowest step and gave it into her hand. And she sprang off his shoulder and up the steps before him, and was quite cured. Then were the father and mother beyond measure rejoiced, and they gave Hans gifts of gold and of silver, and whatsoever else he wished for, that they gave him. And when he got to the other castle he went at once into the wood, house, and found the key under the log of wood behind the door, and took it to the lord of the castle. He also was not a little pleased, and gave Hans as a reward much of the gold that was in the chest, and all kinds of things besides, such as cows, and sheep, and goats. When Hans arrived before the king, with all these things, with the money, and the gold, and the silver, and the cows, sheep, and goats, the king asked him how he had come by them. Then Hans told him that the griffin gave everyone whatsoever he wanted. So the king thought he himself could make such things useful, and set out on his way to the griffin. But when he got to the lake, it happened that he was the very first who arrived there after Hans, and the man put him down in the middle of it and went away, and the king was drowned. Hans! however, married the daughter and became king. Ulrich and Samuel, although seemingly more intelligent, fail in their attempts because they tried to deceive the king with frog legs and pig hair instead of providing what was promised. On the other hand, Hans, perceived as foolish, succeeds through honesty and cleverness. The significance of paying attention and listening is evident in the story. By eavesdropping under the bed, Hans gains crucial information from the conversation between the princess and the magical bird. This skill aids him in solving various challenges. The characters who are considered wise or knowledgeable, Ulrich and Samuel, fail in their quests. In contrast, Hans, often labeled as foolish, demonstrates wisdom in his actions, showcasing that true wisdom may come from unexpected sources. This is the end of the story, do you like it? I will continue to bring meaningful fairy tales tomorrow. See you again, bye bye!